It's 1920, and at Port Jefferson, Long Island, wondrous thing called wireless is heading for new horizons. From this 410-foot tower, American thought will zoom westward across the Pacific to Japan and eastward over Atlantic waters into Middle Europe. Some months later in Madrid, King Alfonso of Spain attends his nation's war exhibit and is frankly and openly impressed by the now grotesquely complicated machinery of this newest marvel of communications. But Alfonso sees this giant in its infancy. At Bordeaux, wireless station built by U.S. Navy becomes nerve center of Radio France as U.S. government turns this gigantic transmitter over to French. Now France will have sending and receiving station in new world of sound. Officials of both United States and France listen as Admiral Magruder makes formal presentation and Monsieur Deschamps accepts the gracious gift. Then in 1923, England joins network of nations to be linked by the magic and marvel of wireless. At rugby, then world's largest antenna rises high over countryside. And here's England's famed Biggin Hill construction, first British wireless station to receive American voice. From over 3,000 miles of land and ocean, words spoken in America are heard by Captain West of the British Broadcasting Corporation. And then messages relayed to all receiving sets in England. The big voice booms over wider horizons still. It's 12th of February, 1931, and priests of every nation go to local shrines to hear Pope Pius speak by radio from Vatican City. Here are Apostolic Delegate Most Reverend Bione, Center, and Monsignors McCormick and McKenna, listening to what was then most breathtaking broadcast in already fabulous history of radio. Pope Pius prayed for peace, but there was war. And from Tokyo came not only bullets, but words as well. The sleek, sly voice of Tokyo Rose could slither through tight blockades and well-armored battle lines as she spoke not to the Nipponese, but to American soldiers. They heard her tell of Japanese victories and American defeats and would have believed what she told them had the air not been filled with voices from America describing American victories and Japanese defeats. And out of warring Germany pours voice of Radio Leipzig, filling air over allied lines with defeatist lullaby of lies. Wireless is strange new weapon of war, weird machine designed to turn the minds of men. Here at airport and nation's capital is Mildred Gellers, Axis Sally, who, like Tokyo Rose, bombarded our troops with traitorous words. It's 24th of August, 1948, and Miss Gellers is on her way to prison. Peace comes, but the war of words goes on and on. Here's Russia's representative Mullick preaching the gospel according to Stalin in this 1950 session of the United Nations, and his voice is heard afar. In Czechoslovakia, for instance, Russian radios are made available to everyone. They aren't real radios, however, but speakers hooked by wire to central receiving station so that radio audiences in Czechoslovakia hear only what Moscow wants them to hear. It's same sad story in every nation under stern rule of Soviet Union. But free men too can fight. Here's colossal nerve center of freedom's greatest weapon in worldwide war of words. It's gigantic sounding board of many tongued voice of America. Riding powerful airwaves out of the land of the free, truth fills the skies of Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Russia, and all lands around the earth where lies are lighting the way to world dictatorship. Truth on the wings of wireless here circles the globe as the big voice of freedom booms out for all the world to hear. It's 5th of November, 1930. And here in El Paso, Texas, late rising businessmen don't bother with breakfast at home. 
On streetcar taking them from suburbs into city offices, there's interesting and filling bill of fare. On electric stoves operated by current from trolley wires, Cook feeds commuters on their way to work. It's same as having dinner on a diner of a speeding super chief. Only here, it's breakfast of sizzling bacon and eggs on El Paso's super trolley. If this police dog's fond companion looks something like famed comedian Charles Spencer Chaplin, he should. For dog's friend is none other than Sid Chaplin, Charlie's less famous brother. It's 1919, and Sid is happy about his sad-faced brother's success in Hollywood. Here with President von Kleinschmidt of USC is Madame Ernestine Schumann Hank. It's 1919, and famed contralto is visiting friend and admirer. Once an obscure German housewife, Madame Schumann Hank gained fame as star of Metropolitan Opera and thrilled millions with her songs on the concert stage. This Chicago father of three is none other than Ringgold Wilmer Lardner, better known as Ring Lardner. It's again 1919, and here's writer Ring doing what comes naturally to leading sports reporter and humorist of the day. Ring's best books were about ball players and Broadway's cockeyed characters. It's January 1926, and they're suffering in Europe once again. The whole continent now falls victim to onslaught of driving winds, heavy rains, and swollen rivers. Sign says bicycling forbidden on this flooded German street. And what rail travel there is moves dangerously through countless miles of inland surf. At Liège in Belgium, basements and lower floors of 9,000 homes are flooded. Disaster crews rescue many thousands. Food and clothing is brought to thousands more still living in floors above flood level. With millions homeless, scores of blood-struck people die. Even England feels fury of raging winds and roaring rivers as swollen Thames leaps its banks and buries countryside under seemingly endless sea of murky and muddy English water. Lashing gales make gigantic wind tunnel of British waterways. It's rough going on sea lanes, but rougher still for this liner dashed to ground below white cliffs of Dover. In year of peace, Europe wages losing battle with the elements. Rockport, Massachusetts, it's 1931, as Ellis Stenman completes this house built entirely of ordinary, everyday newspaper. You don't look at Mr. Stenman's unique residence, you read it. Walls are rolled and pressed newspaper. And even furniture is made of paper, treated by a formula that Mr. Stenman says is secret. Here's piano that really plays, made no doubt of music section. Only base and walls of fireplace are brick. Here's famous Lindy Desk, made of newspaper devoted to stories of Lindbergh. Stenman spent only 10 years building house. It's 1931, and at airfield in Washington, D.C., Goodyear's baby blimp Puritan is attached to mooring mast to top bus in tryout for new type takeoff. With blimp in tow, bus moves downfield, gathering speed at every foot. This is first attempt to launch lighter than aircraft without aid of ground crew of men. Release lever is in blimp, and pilot will pull away from bus when blimp has sufficient speed for flight. And there it goes. Blimp is suddenly free from towing bus, and as bus slows down, blimp rises gracefully into air. Test is successful as first portable mooring mast in history of aviation passes its examination with flying colors and a floating blimp. Balboa Beauty, 
Vasco Balboa discovered the Pacific in 1513, and in 1921, Balboa, California, discovers these Pacific beauties. And here they are in their beachwear best. No, these aren't figures in Coney Island House of Horror. These are well-dressed bathers of 1921. And here's the most fashionable of them all, Virginia Dobson, Balboa Beach's best-dressed bather. One good laugh deserves another, so here's a second look at the best in beachwear in 1921. The Sterling Miss Sterling. It's 1920. And here's Alexia Sterling of Atlanta winning Canadian Golf Championship. Runner-up is Miss Kate Robertson. Big crowd sees golf as good as 14 karat gold as Miss Sterling wins match and silver plaque in 1920 and again in 1934. The Ruddy Master Ruddy. It's 31st of August, 1929, as 49 swimmers hit chilly waters of Lake Michigan off shores of Chicago at annual two-mile marathon. And of the 49, all but hardy few fall back even in earliest stages of the speedy race. Taking commanding lead over his most expert competitors is 17-year-old New York lad Ray Ruddy. As Ruddy strokes his way toward finish line, he looks like sure winner. And he's a lonely winner, too, because nobody's near him. Ray Ruddy, winning handily, happily handles his winner's cup. 